Hello everyone and welcome to tonight's webinar. I'm delighted and honored to have pharmacist Angela Nace and pediatric allergist Dr. Mike Pissner here to answer questions about the drug epinephrine. This webinar is offered by Kids with Food Allergies as part of its education outreach program. I'm Linda Mitchell, Vice President of the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America Kids with Food Allergies Division and I have the privilege of being your moderator tonight. Presenters for all of our webinars are doing so as volunteers and without compensation. And on behalf of KFA, I'm very grateful for Dr. Mike and Dr. Angela to donate their time to be here with us. I'm going to run through the usual housekeeping details while we put up a poll for you to take. Now, first of all, tonight's webinar is made possible through a sponsorship by Mylan, where we, um, we rely on donors and corporate partners like Mylan for the financial support that enables us to develop education programs for families. And next, please remember that this webinar is of a general nature only and is not medical advice. You need to consult your own physician for any medical advice you seek with regard to food allergy and any other medical condition. Tonight's webinar is being recorded. Um, we have another large audience here with us, um, and so for that reason, everyone's in listen-only mode. However, you are able to type in questions in the GoToWebinar control panel. There's a questions pane. And um, we will be running polls, and you'll have some other ways to participate as well. Um, later in tonight's webinar, we will stop to give away two gift packages from Enjoy Life Foods and two gift packages from Sun Butter. Um, the recipients of these gifts will be picked randomly from those still in attendance later in the webinar. And when we end the webinar, you will see a survey. Please share your impressions with us so we can take your feedback seriously and help direct um, webinar improvements in the future. So now what I'd like to do is to present tonight's um, speakers. Angela Nace, PharmD, Doctor of Pharmacy, is the field coordinator for experiential education and a clinical instructor in the Department of Pharmacy Practice at Jefferson University School of Pharmacy in Philadelphia. In addition, she's a registered pharmacist with 15 years of experience in a variety of pharmacy practice settings. Angela is also a member of the Kids with Food Allergies Board of Advisors and a liaison to the KFA Medical Advisory Team. Her interest in food allergies began over eight years ago when her own daughter was diagnosed with multiple food allergies. Dr. Michael Pissner, MD, MMSC, is a pediatric allergist for Harvard Vanguard Medical Association associates, as well as instructor of pediatrics at Boston Children's Hospital. He is the father of a child with food allergies. He serves in numerous voluntary leadership roles professionally in the food allergy community. He is also a member of the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, where he is a member of the Adverse Reaction to Foods Committee. He is a chair of the medical advisory team for kids with food allergies. He serves on the board of the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America. Uh, in New England chapter as well as the board of the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America National. Um, he's also the author of Everyday Cool with Food Allergies, a children's book, and is co-creator of AllergyHome.org, a website that provides free training modules designed to increase food allergy awareness in the community. Um, so I, I know we're doing some extra little um, quiz type things tonight, and I don't know if Melanie's going to put those up for us next. Um, so we're trying something new just to mix it up a little. And so everyone has a little hand in, the, in their control panel, and you can raise your hand by clicking on that little button where the, you see the arrow on the display screen. So the first question is, have you ever used an epinephrine auto-injector? If you could put your hand up, if you have ever used an auto-injector, then we'll get an idea of how many of you are familiar with using an epinephrine auto-injector. Okay, terrific. Okay, great. And then um, something else. In your, um, in your questions pane, type a 1 if you're very confident about using an auto-injector, 2 if you're somewhat confident, 3 if you're unsure, 4 if you're somewhat uncomfortable, and 5 if you are very uncomfortable. So um, just give us, this is a very informal thing, and um, if you're interested in participating, you can just type that into the questions pane. OK. 
Okay. I see lots of twos and ones and occasional fives. So, okay. Well, with that, I'm just going to go ahead and um, unmute um, Dr. Mike and Angela, and they'll get started with their presentation. And thank you both for joining us tonight. Um, I'm going to let you get started with your presentation. I think Dr. Mike needs to unmute himself. There you go. I'm here. Okay, thank you both for joining us. <laughs> All right, thanks for having us. Um, uh, Angela, I'll let you uh, kick things off here with this uh, poll question. Okay, so it looks like the majority of our participants today are a parent, uh, about 63% there, and then um, somewhat evenly distributed between an educator or school administrator, uh, school nurse, healthcare professional, and then the other category. Okay, Mike, you want to take over? Yeah, you know, I'm interested to know um, how everybody was doing as far as their comfort level. I don't know if we have those results. It was sounding like we had mostly ones and twos, and there were some folks who weren't all that comfortable with uh, epinephrine and auto injectors, and so um, hopefully we'll be getting people all in the range of ones and twos by the time we're done. Um, and so to kick things off, what is anaphylaxis? Uh, anaphylaxis is a severe life-threatening allergic reaction. It can involve one or more body systems. Um, it can range from mild to severe. Each child can have different symptoms from other children, and each kid can actually experience anaphylaxis in different ways with their own reactions. Um, there can be symptoms involving the cardiovascular system. Their heart can race. They can get very pale. Um, they can have symptoms involving neurologic system. They could be irritable, cranky. There can be loss of consciousness. Um, respiratory system, coughing, wheezing, shortness of breath, uh, difficulty swallowing, um, sneezing, uh, skin findings can do occur in many cases, about 80%, but keep in mind that in about 20% of anaphylaxis, we don't see some skin findings. That could be swelling, hives, rash, itching. Um, and some folks also experience gastrointestinal symptoms, belly cramping, vomiting, diarrhea. Food happens to be a common trigger of anaphylaxis, especially in children. So anaphylaxis, severe life-threatening allergic reaction, um, can occur when our allergy cells, the mast cells and basophils, release mediators of inflammation. Uh, these are things that are kept inside these cells. Now, when there's an allergic trigger, these mediators of inflammation leave these allergy cells, and one of the places that they have effect is on the blood vessels. And so that's what this schematic is here. What they do is they dilate some of these blood vessels and they make them leaky. And so this way the liquid that should normally be inside them can leave. And when it does that, it can cause urticaria, hives, it can cause swelling, angioedema, and this swelling can occur, as you see in the picture there, in the face, in the extremities, but also this swelling can occur in the upper airway, and that can cause airway obstruction. Um, now, the fluid shifts leaving the blood vessels can actually be so speedy that up to half of the liquid that's kept inside, half of the intravascular volume, they say, um, can actually leave in about 10 minutes. So anaphylaxis can occur very quickly. Um, now, these mediators of inflammation also can affect directly the heart and can make it beat less efficiently, um, making, again, the, the bringing the, the blood back throughout the body to where it needs to go a little harder for the body um, because not only do we have it in the wrong place with that third spacing, that loss of the volume because of the, the, the leakiness, but then we also have the, um, the heart that is being affected by these mediators of inflammation. Next slide, please. 
So another place where these where the things inside these allergy cells affect is smooth muscle and also mucus cells. And so with the smooth muscle, it makes it twitchy. And what that can do when it's in the gut is make nausea, uh, we can make vomiting and diarrhea, losing more fluid. In the lungs, it can cause bronchoconstriction, um, symptoms of asthma, coughing, wheezing, shortness of breath. And in the gut, it makes the hypovolemia that fluid loss even worse because you're losing fluids through vomiting and diarrhea. Um, and that can put even more stress on the heart because now you have less volume um, and that can make kids' hearts beat very fast and that can also make people have low blood pressure. Now in the case of the lungs, um, with these mediators of inflammation, um, it can make the twitchiness in the lungs and make it worse when they already have upper airway swelling. Now, those mucus cells can then cause mucus plugging and, again, um, cause respiratory issues. Now, when I keep saying those mediators of inflammation and those allergy cells, one of many is histamine. Um, there's also leukotrienes. There's um, many, many others other than antihistamines and, or other than histamines. So that's something to keep in mind is that there's a lot of stuff in there and so you're going to need a way to take care of the effects caused by these things other than just an antihistamine. Next slide, please. So you can make the correlation between anaphylaxis and water damage. The longer anaphylaxis remains untreated, the more end organ effects occur and treatment becomes increasingly difficult. Okay, so what is epinephrine? Epinephrine is a prescription medication, also known as adrenaline. It's the first line emergency treatment for anaphylaxis and it's a direct acting sympathomimetic alpha adrenergic and beta adrenergic agonist. Next slide please. So how does epinephrine work in an allergic reaction? Epinephrine has a very complex bidirectional effect on many target organs. This slide lists um, the various ways is in which epinephrine works to help stop the effects of anaphylaxis. So epinephrine decreases vasodilation, which improves the blood supply to various tissues in the body. It increases peripheral vascular resistance, which helps to alleviate the GI or gastrointestinal symptoms. And it, increase, it also decreases mucosal edema and increases bronchodilation, which causes the blood vessels in the lungs to relax and then leads to improves breathing by opening the airways. Next slide, please. So now, epinephrine works really well in that not only is it going to work on the end organs, but it also works directly on those allergy cells, on those mast cells and basophils that I told you about before. Um, so with some of the effects that Angela was just telling us about, not only does it act in a sense as the sump pump and the mop, but it also is the wrench in turning off the source of this problem. So the beta agonistic, uh, one of, one of the, the ways and one of the receptors that epinephrine works works right there on the walls of these allergy cells and actually makes them a little less trigger happy, um, making it harder for these things to degranulate. Um, therefore, making it a little harder for these allergic reactions, anaphylaxis, to progress. It also works directly um, by, um, Angela mentioned, decreasing vasodilation. And so what that does is it takes these blood vessels and it kind of firms them up and it brings the blood back to where it needs to go. Um, it increases the vascular resistance, same deal, keeps the blood in the blood vessels, keeps them where they need to be. It, it decreases the mucosal edema, that's the swelling, um, so it's going to 
open up the airway. It's going to keep that upper airway obstruction that we both mentioned um, uh, at bay. Um, and it's going to increase the bronchodilation. That's going to help the lungs with the twitchiness, and it is going to open them up and make it e easier to breathe. So epinephrine really works um, really everywhere where we need it to. And now, just the opportunity to then say, with antihistamines, they work well on the skin. Um, there are many histamine receptors found on the skin, um, and um, that really is the organ that antihistamines work on, while again, epinephrine really works at the end organs that we need it to, and right there directly at those allergy cells. Okay, so what epinephrine products are currently available? There are currently four epinephrine auto-injectors available on the market today. And the choice which epinephrine product is prescribed is an important decision between you and your child's physician or your health care provider. It's important to make sure that, that you, your child, and your child's caregiver are very comfortable and familiar with the proper administration of the product that is being prescribed. Uh, each device operates differently, and you want to make sure that those people who are involved with your child and your child's care have been adequate, adequately trained to use the device as prescribed. So whether it's your doctor, your pharmacist, or the company's website, um, any of those can provide you detailed instructions with um, appropriate use. Next slide, please. All commercially available epinephrine products that were listed on the previous slide are available in both the 0.15 milligrams and the 0.3 milligram strengths. They all also contain two pre-filled devices, um, and it's important to make sure that those two are carried with you or your child um, at all times. And they also have similar needle lengths and gauges, and what gauges is the actual thickness of the needle. The EpiPen Junior, for example, needle length is a half an inch long, and the EpiPen Epi needle length is slightly longer, it's about 5 eighths of an inch, and they both contain a 22 gauge needle. Various epinephrine products have demonstrated similar peak and total epinephrine delivery with similar safety and bioequivalence in clinical trials. And finally, all the products do have a similar cost and offer um, some type of discount or copay program, uh, which we'll talk about towards the end of the program. Um, one more detail I want to point out with regard to cost of epinephrine auto-injectors is that it's important for you to be aware that your pharmacy benefits manager determines the price of the medication, not your actual pharmacy. So if you have any questions or concerns regarding your out-of-pocket costs, um, it's best to contact your pharmacy benefits provider. Um, also, your retail pharmacist is a good resource for you to tell you what your out-of-pocket costs or copay would be for each of the available products, because it could vary um, you know, depending on what your pharmacy benefits manager determines. Now, as far as those uh, um, needle lengths that, that Angela was just talking about, kind of um, that 5 8 inch EpiPen length there um, is actually shorter than a dime, just to put things in perspective. And when we get a flu shot, um, the, the width, uh, the thickness of the needle is actually way fatter um, than the needles that are used on those auto-injectors. And actually, they're kind of so skinny that it's a problem that if you happen to try to use an auto-injector on the seam of your jeans, it may not go through and it may bend back and not get to where it needs to. And so all of those downsides are actually upsides um, when it comes to a kid's perspective on that needle. And so those might be ways to help obviate or decrease some of the fear and anxiety that comes. Um, and what's amazing is if some sometimes in developmentally appropriate way, if you ask your kiddo how long they thought the needle was, little kids oftentimes think that it's the length of the entire auto-injector device because why else would it be so long? Um, and so just giving them that fact may actually make them feel a whole lot better about it. Okay, next slide please. So as with any medication, side effects commonly occur. Most of the side effects associated with epinephrine are mild and typically don't last very long. Uh, the slide here lists the most common side effects associated with its use, and like I said, they are mild and short-lasting. Short 
These can include faster heart rate, GI symptoms, paleness, weakness, headache, and potentially shakiness or nervousness. Uh, there could be additional side effects other than those listed here that may occur, but it's important to understand that epinephrine is the treatment of choice for anaphylaxis, as we previously discussed. Um, and your physician and pharmacist are aware of these potential side effects and also the benefits of epinephrine. And in some of the cases here, some of these side effects are actually the medicine working in just the way we want it to. So that paleness, um, the blood is actually going to where we want it to. It's not going to the peripheral um, blood vessels that, that, that are around the skin, but it's bringing the blood back to, to, to the heart to allow it to pump throughout where we want to get it. That shakiness, uh, sometimes the epinephrine is working on receptors on the muscle, um, and that is expected. That's not something bad that's coming along with it. That's just a, an expected effect. Um, and uh, um, and again, these are these are things that are mild um, and short-lived, and something that 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 shouldn't keep people from doing what they need to do and treating appropriately. Right, right, and the, and the benefits of epinephrine do far outweigh these risks. So just keep that in mind. So, okay, next slide, which I think is our uh, next poll question. Okay, so um, I believe, are they going to use their, okay, here we go. So the poll question is, epinephrine requires storage at certain temperatures. So if you can just um, click on your screen if you think that's true or false, we'll give everybody about 10 to 15 seconds to lock in their responses. And then we will show the results. Okay, so it looks like the majority of you, 91%, uh, believe that this is true, uh, which is correct. Um, epinephrine does require storage at certain temperatures. Um, there are several important guidelines to follow with regard to storing your epinephrine auto-injector. Uh, first of all, the drug should always appear clear and colorless. When it is exposed to air or light, the epinephrine deteriorates very rapidly and will become pink or brown. If you know, um, excuse me. If you notice that the color has changed from clear to pink or brown, um, we do not use it. Also, if you notice any type of solid particles or a precipitate in the product, um, do not use it then as well. Uh, next, the ideal storage temperature for all epinephrine products is room temperature, which ranges from 68 to 77 degrees, and you are not supposed to refrigerate epinephrine. Um, excursions are permitted between the, ra the temperature ranges of 59 and 86, uh, provided that they do not exceed 24 hours. Uh, any spikes in temperatures up to 40 degrees may be permitted as long as they also do not exceed 24 hours. Uh, there is no stability data for temperatures below 59 degrees, so therefore it's not recommended to use when it does fall below this temperature. Um, not, um, also, with regard to light, um, you, you, extreme cold or heat, you should not, re, re, I'm sorry, exposure to light causes a rapid loss in potency and color change that I described earlier. Um, it's a, important to know, too, that the thickness of the plastic canister for EpiPen, for example, acts as a shield from light penetrating it. And also, one thing to keep in mind with regard to EpiPen as well is the case that it comes in is not waterproof. And if it does get wet, the moisture um, may develop in the product and which can interfere with the um, functionality of the injector. Okay, our next poll question is expiration dates on epinephrine auto-injectors don't really mean anything. So if you can indicate your response by being true or false, and we'll give everybody um, another 10 to 15 seconds to indicate their responses. Now, while everyone is uh, putting in their responses here, I just wanted to jump in. Um, we very briefly touched upon anaphylaxis. Um, and now that can and has been a webinar in itself. So many people probably still want to know what symptoms delineate anaphylaxis? Um, now for that, having allergy action plans, emergency care plans filled out and created with your healthcare provider is going to be a really important step. Passing along those allergy action plans, those emergency care plans to anyone who's caring for your child is going to be really important. And then if you want to 
find out a little bit more about some um, a really great resource for symptoms of uh, anaphylaxis is the NIAID um, summary for patients, families, and caregivers, and we're going to put up a link for, um, for those uh, at the end of the webinar. Okay, great. So we, it looks like we have our responses for the next question. Um, so it, it is correct. It is, I mean, it is false. Uh, looks like most of you got it correct, I, I should say. Um, so out-of-date epinephrine products may not provide the proper dose needed to effectively treat an anaphylaxis episode. This also pertains to out-of-date products that do appear clear or without discoloration. Various studies have demonstrated that epinephrine um, content correlates inversely with the length of time past the expiration date. So what this means is that the longer the medication has been expired, the less effective it will be. Please keep in mind that you can administer an out-of-date epinephrine product to treat anaphylaxis only when there's no other option available to you. And because epinephrine use is so unpredictable and infrequent, you always should be familiar um, of the product that you have and its expiration date. Uh, many of the manufacturers often offer a refill reminder on their website so you could sign up and they could send you um, emails or text messages when your product is about to expire so you can replace it. And now keep in mind that the caution with using an expired auto injector isn't that that is going to hurt you but it might not help you as much as it should. Um, and so some of the studies that, uh, that, or one of the studies I think that Angela is also referring to demonstrated that um, three years expired auto injectors, actually the epinephrine um, was about 80% effective. And so an old expired one is better than nothing. Right. Okay, great. So now we move on to our next question, which is once, once epinephrine has been administered to treat an anaphylaxis reaction, the patient should be monitored at home. So if you can uh, indicate your response as being true or false, we'll give everybody a few minutes to um, answer this question. Okay, so it looks like the majority of you got it correct that um, the answer is false. So 97% had indicated false. And as we mentioned earlier in the presentation, epinephrine is used as an emergency treatment for anaphylaxis. Um, it is a rapid-acting drug with a short half-life, so the relief of symptoms are often temporary. So um, after experiencing anaphylaxis, patients are required to go to the nearest emergency room by ambulance because further medical treatment may be required. It's also helpful to bring your used epinephrine for inspection for the healthcare provider and also proper disposal. And now, oftentimes, uh, healthcare providers say to their families, use your auto injector and then call 911. Um, and now, what that sometimes does is it kind of creates this situation where people think that, gosh, I'm giving a medicine that is going to make it so I need to call 911. That medicine must be dangerous. I don't know if I'm ready to give this medicine and I don't really feel like calling 911 so I'm not going to give the medicine. That's two mistakes. Um, so now you're calling 911 because you do need additional emergency care and it's because it was a bad enough reaction to need epinephrine in the first place and you may need additional epinephrine and you may need additional care. Um, and so thinking about things in a slightly different way, which is you call 911 and get emergency care because you are experiencing anaphylaxis is the way to think about it. And not allowing um, anything to get in the way of treating anaphylaxis with epinephrine is going to be important. So the first step is to administer an auto-injector and then it's to call 911, but not because of the epinephrine, but because of the anaphylaxis. Okay, we're moving on to our next poll question, which is proper epinephrine administration is via intramuscular or IM injection. So please indicate whether you think this is true or false. Okay. 
Okay, so it looks like uh, the majority of you, 90%, had indicated true, uh, which is correct, and I will explain that on the next slide. Okay, so epinephrine is most effective when injected in intramuscularly, or IM, into the outer thigh. This is because the thigh muscle has the greatest blood flow, which makes the absorption of epinephrine quicker. Also, epinephrine auto-injectors can be injected through closing, clothing if necessary. It's important to apply pressure when giving the injection to allow penetration into the muscle and also to rub the site after, inject, after the injection. Remember to hold the injection in place uh, for five seconds for AviQ and 10 seconds for the other products. And finally, we want to make sure epinephrine is injected into the muscle because various studies have demonstrated that subcutaneous administration does not produce high enough levels of epinephrine needed to treat um, an anaphylaxis reaction. And that thigh muscle is really important because it is well vascularized. Lots of blood is going to it. Lots of blood is leaving it. So this way, when you put the epinephrine in there, it's going to get to peak levels through the body faster. Um, they say somewhere around eight minutes. And then that subcutaneous, when you don't get it into the muscle, um, then it can take much longer, up to 30 minutes to get there. Uh, and then also, um, some people have wondered, what about the shoulder? And that also is not vascularized enough and isn't going to get the medicine uh, where it needs to get fast enough. Okay, so this uh, slide here gives you a little bit of a visualization on the layers of skin so you can actually see how deep um, and where the muscle layer is. So the picture on the right actually um, illustrates the top layer of skin, which is called the subcutaneous layer. Um, and that's, you know, cause you see how the needle is going um, just in that top layer there. And that's, um, those types of injections are more common for insulin, for example. Um, and then the one on the left is the intramuscular um, injection. And as you can see, the muscle layer is deep down beneath the subcutaneous tissue. Um, and it's important to point out also, I know we, we talked briefly about needle length earlier, um, but you know, the, the needle lengths that are depicted in these pictures here um, are certainly you know, not the, the length that um, are, are available in the available epinephrine products. So I just wanted to point that out. That's why uh, we recommend and the manufacturers recommend applying pressure to make sure that you do reach that, um, that, that muscle. All right, so more than one dose of epinephrine may be required to effectively treat anaphylaxis. You guys are dead on. We, we made some pretty easy questions, I think, here. <laughs> the 95% got it right, um, and that is correct. So more than one dose of epinephrine sometimes is necessary. So as Angela was saying earlier, epinephrine is quickly metabolized, and its effects are often temporary, and repeated doses are sometimes required. And so if symptoms remain or progress, repeated dosing may be required after 5 to 15 minutes. Um, so this will be something to talk to your healthcare providers about, um, uh, something that should also be noted in those allergy action plans, in those emergency care plans. Um, and they say somewhere, you know, up to 10 to 20 percent of people um, that, that got a dose of epinephrine may require more than one dose. Yeah, and I think it's, I think that kind of goes back to our point also of why it's important to carry two, um, you know, with you at all times. True or false? One limitation of epinephrine is that it is currently available in only two fixed doses. Let's see if we can get 100% this time. <laughs> so close to 80% um, correct. Um, and. Uh, um,
currently there's two doses available. The 0 0.15 milligram dose, the junior dosing, and the 0 0.3 milligram, I like to call it the senior dosing. Um, and so this is a place where sometimes there's a little bit of confusion, um, and uh, Angela and I can definitely speak to that. Um, in the package insert, it is written that you updose um, at a higher dosing than the recommendations from the American Academy of Pediatrics. Uh, so what the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends and, and what is recommended by allergists and, um, and is to upsize, to go from the 0 0.15 dosing um, at 55 pounds up to 0 0.3. So I just made that a little confusing. When a kiddo hits 55 pounds, then they should be prescribed the 0 0.3 milligram. I actually try to make it so by the time they are 55 pounds, they are walking around with a um, 0 0.3 milligram auto injector. Um, for children less than 22 pounds, um, having a conversation with a doctor um, is going to be important, but typically uh, there's no alternative to those um, 0 0.15 milligram doses and uh, um, so just really um, having a conversation about the doctor and learning um, what that auto injector should be given for, what are the symptoms of anaphylaxis is going to be important. Um, but um, the take home point really with any of these is having an auto injector to be able to treat anaphylaxis is going to be really important. Um, Angela, anything to add? Um, no, and I, you know, I know as as a pharmacist too, and, and also as a parent, uh, you know, I, there, like you said, this is a little bit of a gray area because it, it's different from what is actually in the the package insert, um, you know, and and you know, you can also there's you know the the study is on there and the information, um, you know, I had some issues with my daughter who was kind of on the cusp and you know. Um, just kind of make, you know, being aware, I think, of these the recent guidelines and recommendations and, and educating, you know, those that potentially that aren't, whether it's your pediatrician or your pharmacist, um, to make sure that, you know, you do have the right dose for your child. Yeah, and unfortunately, with just these two doses available, it is imperfect. Um, but the, 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 the slight overdosing that can occur in a child that is um, 55 pounds actually many are going to say, and this is why these recommendations were made, is far better than the underdosing that occurs when you continue to have a lower dose auto injector. Um, and that these differences in the doses when we're talking about this IM, this intramuscular medication in these auto injectors, really isn't the, the overdosing that causes um, potentially dangerous complications, like if a epinephrine dose was inappropriately given through an IV and it was, instead of being the more dilute 1 to 10,000, it was the more concentrated 1 to 1,000, then we have an issue where that type of overdosing can cause real problems. True or false, even when prescribed, epinephrine is not used frequently enough for the treatment of anaphylaxis. True, we're all on fire. Ninety-four percent say that it isn't used frequently enough. And Angel, I'll let you take this. Okay, so epinephrine is is often constantly um, 
consistently underused, uh, used inappropriately, or delayed in use. And a lot of the common reasons for this is um, it could be needle fear, needle fear for the patient, for the person giving the injection, you know, not thinking epinephrine is really necessary. And also, many people who don't use epinephrine fail to do so because they think the symptoms are going to resolve on their own. But clearly, I think we've gotten the message across in this webinar that they're not going to go on their own and that this is the appropriate treatment. So, you know, appropriate epinephrine treatment in a timely manner can decrease mortality from anaphylaxis. And so studies do show that um, with delays in the appropriate treatment of anaphylaxis, the appropriate administration of epinephrine, it increases the chance of mortality, increases the risk of death. Um, and then one of the things that isn't specifically mentioned in this slide is, is that what people don't want to do is have the idea that antihistamines or other medications other than epinephrine are going to do a job in actually um, decreasing severity or stopping anaphylaxis. Um, epinephrine really is the drug for that. All right, to close it up, um, epinephrine is first-line, life-saving medical treatment of anaphylaxis. We are now beating a dead horse. Um, immediate epinephrine use is critical in the event of an anaphylactic reaction. Um, epinephrine side effects are mild and typically short-lived, and anaphylaxis is often unpredictable, and therefore it's important to carry um, auto-injectors epinephrine at all times. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Angela and Dr. Mike. It's such important information for those of us who have prescribed epinephrine for our children. We really need to understand when and how to use it um, since it's the life-saving treatment for anaphylaxis. Um, we're going to have some more questions and answers with Dr. Mike and Angela, but first we're going to go ahead and do the giveaways. Um, so what I'm going to do is Oops, we're going to, I guess we're going to go to the questions first. <laughs> so, um, well, let me just back up for just a minute before we start this question. Um, um, we got a lot of questions regarding um, knowing where exactly to inject um, when you're using an auto-injector and how do you know if you actually have gotten it into the muscle. So I was wondering if you could go over where exactly on the leg this knee needs to be administered and how they would best know how to use the thing properly. So this is challenging in that we can't necessarily show anybody. This is like, I like being able to actually show someone where the auto injector is going to go. So I guess everybody look down at your leg um, and uh, look at your knee look at your hip and go then about halfway between the two. Um, now, point down at the top of your leg. That's not where we're going. We're not going at the top. Now point with your finger all the way to the side of your leg, the lateral most aspect. That's not where we're going either. Somewhere halfway between those and kind of they say the anterior lateral thigh. Um, and uh, that's the meaty part of the muscle. Um, and uh, that's where, uh, where, where, where putting the auto injector is going to be helpful. Now in the little thighs, in those little kids, uh, that swinging jab motion may not be so practical. And applying firm, gentle pressure, making sure that the, the needle is getting into the muscle, um, and then holding for, in the case of the uh, all VQ, five seconds, in the case of the other auto injectors, 10 seconds, and counting on that click. Um, is going to be important. Now, the springs can be loaded pretty firm, and that click can be kind of, it can catch you off guard. So don't let yourself flinch back. Hold it in and count through. That's part of why that count is there. It's going to make you uh, pass that initial poof, and then um, the medicine is delivered. Um, once you withdraw, uh, then looking at your child's thigh, then you could see a small um, needle puncture, and then you know that the needle went in. 
um, and uh, um, you're not necessarily going to have uh, any other evidence. In the case of the EpiPen, the orange um, needle protector is now going to be over the needle, so you won't necessarily see the needle. In the case of the AlviQ, it withdraws, but now in the case of the uh, generic and the AdrenaClick, those you will see the needle still out of the device. Angela, anything to add? No, I think that that's great, Mike. And I think also, um, you know, as long as you don't see any type of, you know, leaking medication on the clothing or on, on the, the child or the patient, um, you know, that could be an indication that it didn't get in um, where it needed to go. And, and, and just also simply seeing some improvement in their symptoms, um, a reversal of the anaphylactic effect, you know, should happen pretty quickly as well. So those can be other indicators that the, um, the medication was administered properly. Okay, thank you. Um, in our follow-up email to everyone, we're also going to include links to the epinephrine auto-injector websites, and each of them have training videos where you can actually see a demonstration of the proper place to inject and how to use the device. So um, I just wanted to emphasize that look for that follow-up email after the session. It will come in a couple of days. So okay, um, so what is the role of Benadryl or other antihistamines in the treatment of anaphylaxis? So now as I mentioned earlier when going through some of what is going on in the body in anaphylaxis, um, that the skin findings um, those are things that the antihistamines can be very helpful with. Um, there are many histamine receptors in the skin, and the antihistamines mainly work there. They're slow to act. They take about 30 to 60 minutes to kick in. And again, they're really only dealing with um, the skin findings. Um, and so they should be used only as secondary treatment um, if they're going to be used at all. And so giving antihistamines, and this is, I'll read it straight from the NIAID guidelines summary for patients and families, antihistamines should only be used as a secondary treatment. Giving antihistamines instead of epinephrine may place you at significantly increased risk for a life-threatening allergic reaction. So that's straight out of those guidelines for families. Now, some of the things that um, some allergists and other healthcare providers choose not to include antihistamines on those emergency care plans. Some do put them on there. Um, and some folks, um, in my case, I'll speak personally as an allergist, um, I stay away from Benadryl because I find that it has sedating effects, especially in young children. And one of the ways that um, families are going to monitor their child is going to be their mental status, um, how they're acting. And if you have a very tired, sleepy child, um, it's pretty difficult to tell if they're cranky, irritable, if they're feeling really horrible. Um, and, uh, and also, some people are going to also base some of their emergency care plans and whether or not epinephrine is going to be given based on some skin symptoms. And if we are taking care of skin symptoms with an antihistamine, it may complicate matters and make it a little harder to judge if and when it's appropriate to give epinephrine. So that's the thought process that sometimes goes into why some people may choose not to include antihistamines on those action plans, while others do include it. And they are a, a backup medicine that's given after, I shouldn't say backup, but I should say a secondary medicine that's given after the epinephrine is administered. Okay. But mind you, antihistamines have a role in treating skin rash and skin findings. But in this question here, what's their role in anaphylaxis, um, that's where um, epinephrine really is the thing to be thinking about. Okay. Um, how do you know when you, I think we already covered that question. Yeah, yeah. we hit this one. Yeah. Um, okay, can epinephrine cause a heart attack? Now, in the cases that I, I was mentioning it earlier, that if epinephrine is given inappropriately through an IV and it is the more concentrated dose, 
um, and it is given in huge amounts higher, um, then it can cause myocardial ischemia, it can cause heart attack, and can cause problems like that. Um, now, in the way that we're all thinking about it, in an IM dose in a healthy kid, um, then the risk of really anything like this is absolutely minimal. Um, and so we do take care and caution with certain things. There are certain medications that um, somebody might be on that talking to your doctor about is going to be important. Those are things like Mayo um, inhibitors, um, certain sympathomimetics, um, certain, uh, um, certain specific medications that, that your doctor will talk to you about. Still, even when being on those, if someone's experiencing anaphylaxis, then epinephrine is the treatment that's important. Also, keep in mind um, that people um, who are reluctant, who have cardiovascular disease, older folks who are nervous about the side effects of epinephrine, um, that anaphylaxis itself can cause myocardial ischemia and um, arrhythmias. Um, and so poorly treated, not treated anaphylaxis, not appropriately treated with epinephrine itself is a risk in that case. Thank you. Okay, next question. What are the risks of administering epinephrine to someone who's not experiencing anaphylaxis, such as an accidental ingestion or giving it to a child when they think they're having an allergic reaction, but actually they're not? Well, I'm going to kind of poke a funny here. The accidental injection as opposed to ingestion, the accidental in ingestion of an auto-injector <laughs> would cause some, some <laughs> more problems than the epinephrine. <laughs> but um, I would say uh, um, what we talked about before, some of those expected side effects are exactly what we would expect in somebody who didn't need it anyway. And always erring on the side of caution and keeping that in mind that, you know, paleness, shakiness, irritability, a little bit of headache, um, some, some GI, some like nausea, these are things that are really doable. And so if somebody is nervous, if somebody's on the fence, if they're not sure, if they're looking at their action plan and they're thinking, I think that, that, that this is what we need to do, then go ahead, give the epi. Um, and even if they didn't have it after all, um, then those side effects we talked about are really what you can expect. Um, but then, you know, in the joke that I just made about uh, in getting it in the wrong place, that's a slightly different story. If somebody inadvertently puts an auto-injector off in their thumb, in their finger, in any sort of extremity or really anywhere where it shouldn't go, um, then there can be local effects because epinephrine is awesome at clamping down blood vessels and your tip of your pinky needs that blood. And so when it clamps down, um, it can cause problems there, and uh, getting uh, medical uh, help is going to be important. Great. Um, do we have <clears throat> is it OK to use expired auto-injectors to practice on oranges? And how should expired auto-injectors be disposed of? Angel, you want to go for this? Well, sure. So, um, in terms of expire, you know, practicing on oranges, you know, that that is kind of, you know, I do hear that a lot from people. Um, you know, I guess it, it's supposed to type type of, you know, sort of mimic the the um, the injection into a muscle. Um, you know, I think you know it's important to be careful with that because people can accidentally inject themselves, um, you know, if they don't have a good grasp on it or whatnot. So, um, you know, if you're going to do that, you need to, to really be cautious. Um, and then in terms of expired auto injectors and how they should be discarded, um, I, you know, I think it's important you can either um, contact a school nurse at your child's school. I know that my daughter's school um, does take the expired EpiPens and they use them to train the teachers with. Um, and also I know um, physicians' offices, your allergists, pediatricians, whatnot, um, and also potentially you can ask your pharmacies, um, you know, how they can, you know, recycle them and dispose of them properly. And as far as the training on oranges, I've 
definitely heard many people uh, set off the auto injectors in their hands. I think that the training devices are adequate and just while people are being trained and training off of the, the training devices, um, knowing that there is a click, that's the difference that you're going to get before a live auto, between a live auto injector and uh, uh, the trainers is that that spring loading is a, it, it feels a little different. Um, but if you know that and you use the regular auto in, uh, auto injector trainers, it shouldn't be too much of a problem. And then uh, bringing them to your healthcare providers uh, a, a, a good way to discard them. Okay, terrific. How do you carry or store epinephrine on a very hot or very cold days in order to protect? I think you kind of touched on this, but we kept getting questions. Um, well, what if I think it got a little cold, but I'm not sure it got cold enough to worry about, and does the color always change if it's been exposed to you know, extreme temperatures? Can you answer some of those? Yeah, I mean, you know, unfortunately, it is somewhat of a gray area. Um, you know, and it is important to know that, you know, and I did, I did actually call the, um, the drug companies to just get some more clarification on this, um, you know, and they, they really do s stress the importance that there's really no stability data for temperatures below 59 degrees, so, which means that, you know, we, it's kind of unknown whether or not epinephrine is stable, um, if it has any type of deterioration when it's below this temperature, so in that case, it's really not recommended to use um, you know, uh, we did talk a little bit about, you know, carrying it and storing it, um, you know, and, and like Mike said, you know, you, you know, people you know, go skiing, people go to the beach, you know, um, you know, th there might be different types of methods you want to try. You could try, um, you know, maybe using some type of an insulated carrier, um, perhaps, um, and try to, you know, and it's 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 kind of a it's, it is it's kind of a gray area, and it is you know it, it is a little bit challenging. I mean, definitely any type of precipitation or a color change, um, you know, it's definitely not recommended to use for that. Um, any other tips that you want to add, Mike? You know, it's funny. I think that you and I might have been discussing this, but I don't think I actually said it on the webinar. But um, <laughs> if you want to go for outdoor sports, keep it on the inside part of your your coat. So this way, if you're comfortable then it is at a relatively reasonable temp. Um, and so this way, if it's inside your, your insulation uh, where, where your body would be, um, if you're OK, it's probably going to be OK. Um, and if you start getting crazy cold, uh, then you're going to go inside because otherwise you're going to get hypothermic. Um, right. And so therefore, it's going to kind of keep the uh, um, epinephrine at a reasonable temperature. And then by the same the, the, the flip side is on a hot beach, when you start baking in the sun, um, you're going to go in the shade. And so keeping them with you and then potentially using some sort of um, uh, insulation to kind of keep it at a more reasonable temp is going to be something you can do. The, the obvious slam dunk problems are going to be you just left your auto injector in your car for 24 hours and you know that it was 110 degrees out. Um, that thing just baked, um, and uh, so replacing that definitely makes sense. Um, and uh, just me as a as a parent, um, forgetting the auto injectors um, in extreme temperatures, uh, I've done it probably three times now. It's really annoying. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, and really, the take home message here is to just kind of keep these guidelines in mind and try to plan ahead as best as possible in these type of extreme temperatures. Okay, terrific. Okay, um, I think we've got two more questions, so we'll try to go through them so we can um, wrap up pretty quickly. Um, how many auto injectors should we carry if we're traveling somewhere that's hard to reach emergency care, like camping or flying on an airplane? And now, so for this, this is just going to kind of be a comfort question and there's going to be no clear correct answer. Um, the idea of being away from additional epinephrine and emergency services um, can be challenging and a little anxiety provoking. Um, having extra auto injectors isn't a bad idea if, if there is a family and they are 
camping in the woods and further away from uh, emergency services than, than in most circumstances, having extra auto injectors is not a bad idea. Okay, terrific. Well, I think that's it in terms of the questions that we have, and we're already a little past 60 minutes, so I'm just going to go ahead and say thank you so much for um, answering everyone's questions. Um, this is such an important topic, just to understand the drugs, not to fear it, and not to hesitate if you need to use it according to your prescription. So um, thank you, Dr. Mike, and thank you, Angela. I really do appreciate it. So I'm going to go ahead ahead with the watch and win giveaways. Um, for the Sun Butter um, gift packs, we have Arda Jarvis and Melissa Nixon. Congratulations. We'll be in touch to make sure you get that. And then for the Enjoy Life giveaway packs, um, we have Rachel Chica and Seth Magnum. So congratulations, and I really um, appreciate all of you coming tonight. Um, we're going to go ahead and archive this webinar in a couple of days, and when we do, we're going to make sure that we email everyone a link to that. Also, there were a lot of questions that weren't covered tonight that are more related to anaphylaxis and you know when to, to actually use the epinephrine auto-injector, and we had a really wonderful question and answer session with Dr. Robert Wood in December, it was November, and so we'll send you a link to that webinar, and also, for those of you who are asking questions about what about using epinephrine with regard to my asthmatic child? We had a really wonderful webinar on asthma and um, food allergy that was in October. So we'll send you links to both of those. Um, so we're also including information on the epinephrine auto-injector discount information so that you have that at your fingertips in case you need to access it. And then um, we'll be in touch with the topic for the March webinar. Um, we don't have that firmed up yet, but we'll be in touch shortly so that we can get that on your calendar and you can plan to attend that as well. So in closing, Kids with Food Allergies is part of the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America, the nation's oldest and largest allergy and asthma charity. Um, if you found today's session helpful, please keep us in mind with your charitable giving plans because we do rely on donations in order to make our programming possible. Um, all the resources that you see on the slides that you're viewing right now, we will certainly um, include in the follow-up email to you as well. So thank you again for attending tonight, and uh, I appreciate your time.